Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Neha Nanda, and today, along with Michael Tube, we'll uh, give you an update on therapeutics for COVID-19 disease. We'll start with an introduction and then talk about severe disease, that's uh, therapeutic options in hospitalized patients, and then talk about options in the outpatient setting. If you have any questions, if you could post them in the chat, we'll definitely get to it uh, at the end of the presentation. With that, um, I'll start with talking about different therapeutics in different stages of the disease, um, then touch on uh, some pivotal trials for remdesivir, and lastly share with you Keck Medicine treatment guidelines for hospitalized patients. So here I share with you the clinical spectrum of COVID-19. The audience here is well versed with this, and this is simply a reiteration. When there's asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic infection, there's only a laboratory evidence of disease with no clinical symptoms. In mild illness, it's typically mild systemic symptoms with no lung involvement. In moderate illness, there is some pulmonary involvement, but the individual does not require oxygen. In severe illness, um, the individual requires some form of oxygen. In critical illness, the person is in respiratory failure or multi-organ dysfunction. So here I wanted to share with you the role of antivirals and immunomodulators in different stages of the disease. And this schematic uh, shows the kinetics of the SARS-CoV-2 viral load following infection in parallel with the interferon response and the evolution of inflammatory cytokines. So on the top panel, what you see is the case of individuals who are typically asymptomatic. And in these individuals, there's a very efficient antiviral immune response that's characterized by a significant production of interferon and a limited production of inflammatory cytokine. And this results likely results in viral eradication. Now let's look at the second panel, the bottom panel where the disease is more severe. In this case, the patients show a delayed production or an ineffective production of interferon and an uncontrolled viral load and subsequently an overproduction of inflammatory cytokines. And in this situation, there's a state of havoc, there's a cytokine storm, and that results in decompensation. So I think with this schematic, it makes sense to use antivirals earlier on in the disease and to continue to use them through the clinical disease while the anti-inflammatory agents or immunomodulators should be used just before the system is about to go into a cytokine storm to make the most of these agents. So the drugs that are available today or are undergoing extensive uh, trials are as follows. If you look at non-severe disease, that includes asymptomatic and mild and moderate illness. Monoclonal antibody seems to be a very prominent agent. Um, it's undergoing studies for asymptomatic disease following high-risk infection. I talk about that later. Monoclonal antibodies, whether in the form of monotherapy or combination therapy, has received an EUA for mild to moderate disease. That's typically outpatients. Other agents that are in bold, uh, I'll touch on later on in the talk. And um, for severe and critical disease, several agents have been studied. This list is in no way in, uh, inclusive. But the bolded drugs are the drugs that, the drugs in bold are the ones that um, Dr. Dubey and I will touch on in the next few minutes. So let's start with remdesivir for severe, uh, for, for severe uh, COVID-19 disease. Um, remdesivir is an antiviral agent and we know that it inhibits the viral RNA dependent, dependent RNA polymerase and is effective against MERS and SARS-CoV-1. We knew that before the pandemic. Now, there have been multiple studies done uh, during the pandemic, and, uh, and, and here I touch on two major studies. That's the ACT-1, 
uh, that's the adaptive COVID-19 treatment trial, ACT-1, and then the solidarity trial. So in ACT-1 trial, uh, what they showed was that remdesivir can reduce the time to recovery in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 disease. This trial was a randomized control trial, um, and they had enrolled 60 sites, of which 45 sites were in the U.S. Inclusion cr criteria was simply anyone with COVID-19 disease who requires hospitalization. Patients were followed for up to 29 days. They enrolled about um, 1,000 patients with five, approximately 500 in the remdesivir arm and 500 in the placebo arm. Um, to give you an idea, 85% of the patients had severe disease and the remainder had mild to moderate disease. Now let's look at some of the text and the Kaplan-Meier estimates that are on the slide. Most benefit was noted in the group that received oxygen. As you can see, their rate, the recovery rate ratio was 1.3. And you see that on the C panel, panel C here on the Kaplan-Meier estimate. There was no benefit noticed in the group that required mechanical ventilation. That's right at the bottom. E, um, and 20% of the patients uh, were on, on mechanical ventilation. In addition, in their post hoc analysis, they noticed a mortality benefit again in the group that received low flow oxygen, that's panel C. So the data was very encouraging. In addition, in their subgroup analysis, they noted that irrespective of the time of starting remdesivir, in this group of patients, there is a benefit, whether it's less than 10 days or more than 10 days. The benefit is more when it's given less than 10 days. Now let's talk about the solidarity trial. It's a huge randomized open label trial where the investigators were looking at mortality in hospitalized patients. They evaluated a couple of drugs um, including remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, calitra, interferon. They followed these patients for about a month, for 29 days. They had 11,000 patients enrolled for, from over 400 hospitals in 30 countries. Primary outcome was, in, was inpatient mortality. The secondary outcome was the percentage of patients who progressed to ventilation and the percentage of patients who get discharged from the hospital. In the remdesivir arm, in the left-hand corner, there were about, around 2,700 patients who received remdesivir and their control arm received uh, had the same number of sites. And in this study with none of the drugs, including remdesivir, they showed a beneficial impact on mortality. As you can see, about 11% deaths in both arms. In addition, they were not able to show a beneficial impact for their secondary outcomes as well. That is the percentage of people who progress to ventilation or patients who get discharged. So this was very discouraging. In their subgroup analysis, it was noted that the group that was not on mechanical ventilation may have some benefit. Of note, about 67% of the patients in solidarity were on oxygen and 10% required mechanical ventilation. Now, if we pool all the trials together, some of the pivotal trials, that solidarity trial, ACT, Wuhan, and SIMPLE trial to look at the clinical efficacy of remdesivir against severe disease, what is shown here is a death ratio of 0.91 with a confidence interval right at the bottom of 0.79 to 1.05. The confidence interval really is comfortably compatible with prevention of a small fraction of all death, deaths, but is also comfortably compatible with prevention of no deaths at all. However, if you look at the subtotal here, where they show that the low risk group that is not on mechanical ventilation, they had about a 20% point estimate mortality benefit in the group that was not ventilated. That is encouraging, though this is a meta-analysis. 
Um, of note, in the solidarity trial, they did not distinguish between subjects who were receiving low flow and subjects who were receiving high flow. In Act 1, they did, and we saw a benefit in the, uh, in the low flow group. So with all this, what's the role of remdesivir in COVID-19 disease? It's definitely appropriate for use in severe disease. It's more beneficial early on in the disease, given its antiviral activity, and it should be maintained through the clinical disease. In the subgroup that required low flow supplemental oxygen, it, like, it does hasten clinical recovery, and it also may reduce mortality. In the subgroup requiring high flow, non-invasive or mechanical ventilation, it may hasten clinical recovery in high flow and non-invasive group as we saw in the ACT-1 trial. There's no clear benefit for patients who are mechanically ventilated. If you look at the impact, uh, impact on mortality, there is no impact on mortality based on the original studies. However, if you recall in the meta-analysis, there was a mortality benefit when all, all the non-ventilated patients were grouped together. With that, I'd, li I'd like to share with you the guidelines for hospitalized patients at Keck Medicine. We encourage the use of remdesivir earlier on in severe disease, given the, given the discussion that we just had. In addition to dexamethasone, since there is uh, impressive mortality be benefit with DEX. Also, if the inflammatory markers are high, we encourage the use of interleukin-6 inhibitors, that's tocilizumab, um, earlier on in the disease. With that, I'll uh, pass it on to Dr. Dubey to talk more about severe disease and options in hospitalized patients. Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Dubay, and I'd like to update you today on pharmacologic interventions for severe COVID disease. Here are my disclosures. Therapeutics for severe disease include antiviral interventions, which currently are antibody-based or antiviral compounds, uh, immune modulators as listed, and I'll talk about all of these. Uh, and then the final question is, how do we combine all of the above? Dr. Nanda already showed this slide. My talk is going to focus on this area here, uh, where the, some overlap between the antiviral interventions and the immune modulators and anticoagulation. The least controversial intervention we'll talk about today is dexamethasone, and it clearly works. In the recovery trial, which I'll talk about more in subsequent sections, uh, randomized individuals to a variety of interventions, uh, including uh, dexamethasone. And uh, compared to usual care, there was a clear survival benefit with the use of dexamethasone in multiple groups, but not in the individuals who are just receiving uh, oxygen. Uh, you can see in the forest plot here that with invasive me mechanical ventilation was the greatest uh, proportion of benefit as compared to those uh, who are not receiving oxygen with an intermediate result with those who are receiving uh, oxygen. Uh, there was a hint of harm from uh, dexamethasone in patients who are not receiving oxygen uh, and there was uh, excess infections in the uh, no oxygen group. There are some remaining questions about dexamethasone, however. What is the optimal dose? They use six milligrams a day for up to 10 days. Uh, six milligrams a day is equivalent to about 40 milligrams a day of prednisone, which is a moderate to high dose. Uh, would a longer course be useful in those who are responding slowly to dexamethasone, or would a higher daily dose be more effective? Uh, these things are still unknown. 
there was a 2.8% absolute reduction or 17% relative reduction in mortality, and that's great, but it still leaves a lot of room for improvement. Uh, what are the benefits in combination dexamethasone with antivirals? And how about the addition of more target immunomodulation? Uh, such as with anti-IL-6 receptor antibodies, such as tocilizumab or cerilumab, uh, or IL-1 receptor antagonists, such as anakinra, or uh, JAK inhibition with baricitinib or dasatinib. There's fairly good evidence now that COVID convalescent plasma is not effective in patients who are hospitalized, and this makes perfect sense. Antibodies are really expected to be most useful in people with early disease. In this recent meta-analysis that was published in JAMA, uh, there was really no suggestion uh, of benefit from uh, COVID convalescent plasma, including in the very large recovery trial uh, shown here in uh, the thick block. There is no benefit for either all cores cause mortality or mechanical ventilation use, and very little evidence that um, convalescent plasma is useful. Uh, and so far, there's no evidence that monoclonal antibodies are useful in, in patients, data that I won't be covering today. As far back as a year ago, there was evidence of important benefit from the use of tocilizumab in severe COVID-19. Importantly, in this trial, uh, tocilizumab was given as a single dose along with antiviral intervention, lopinavir, otonavir, and methylprednisolone. The Chinese were perhaps uh, innovative in their use of uh, aggressive combination therapy early on. There was a prompt and universal improvement in symptoms. Uh, fever, temperature is shown here, uh, and CRP fell very rapidly. Uh, oxygen use fell very rapidly, and oxygen saturations uh, improved promptly. And uh, this prompted the China's National Health Commission to approve uh, the use of tocilizumab uh, about a year ago. In meta-analyses of tocilizumab use from observational trials, uh, there was uh, a benefit for mortality in individuals who uh, received uh, tocilizumab as compared to the standard uh, of care with the meta-analysis shown here and a number needed to treat to prevent one death uh, of about uh, eight individuals. Uh, similarly, the need for mechanical ventilation was reduced in these uh, observational trials, which of course are uh, subject to bias. One such largely negative trial was Covacta, uh, much smaller than some of the more recent trials of tocilizumab. They included both severe and critical illness, including mechanical and ventilated patients. Some got steroids, but importantly, uh, there, were more, there was more steroid use in the placebo group, which um, may have um, inadvertently uh, benefited the uh, placebo recipients. Remdesivir was not used. The primary endpoint of this study was the seven-point ordinal scale at day 28, and there was no difference in the primary endpoint. There was also no significant difference uh, in the 28-day mortality, which was 19% in both groups. There were a few secondary endpoints uh, that showed some benefit with uh, uh, tocilizumab, such as uh, the composite endpoint of death, ICU transfer, or the need for mechanical ventilation, the need for ICU transfer, and duration of ICU stay uh, was lower with uh, tocilizumab as was the time to discharge or being ready for discharge. But overall, uh, a not very impressive result. In the Back Bay randomized TOSI trial, included patients with primarily only moderate illness. Importantly, in this trial, uh, relatively few people got remdesivir and only a small minority received steroids at any time.
there was no improvement in progression to mechanical, vent mechanical ventilation or death, clinical worsening on the ordinal scale, or discontinuation of supplemental oxygen. Uh, fairly convincing that in moderate illness, uh, without the use of uh, steroids, uh, that there was no benefit from tocilizumab. Things changed, though, and uh, in the more recent publication of the IMPACTA study, which also uh, used tocilizumab in patients hospitalized with COVID-19 pneumonia, uh, we begin to see uh, in patients who are receiving glucocorticoids uh, significant benefits from tocilizumab. I'd like to point out our new medicine service chief at LA County USC, Dr. Baden was a co-author on this study. Importantly, this study focused on centers with a high proportion of racial and ethnic minorities, 80% overall. The excluded individuals were on mechanical ventilation, be it non-invasive or invasive. The randomized two to one to tocilizumab versus placebo at that dose. And the primary outcome was the composite endpoint of mechanical ventilation or death by day 28. And they also had a number of secondary endpoints uh, as listed on this slide. Uh, notably, uh, about two thirds of the participants were receiving just supplemental oxygen uh, and uh, a minority uh, received high flow nasal oxygen. But very importantly is the fact that uh, half to slightly more than half received antiviral therapy, uh, as well as uh, a large majority receiving steroids at any time during the study. For the primary endpoint of mechanical ventilation and death, uh, there was a clear and unambiguous uh, benefit to tocilizumab in this study corresponding to approximately 44% reduction in the primary endpoint of mechanical ventilation or death. However, there was no significant improvement in the mortality rate between the treatments, uh, suggesting that um, individuals who receive tocilizumab and subsequently require uh, mechanical ventilation uh, afterwards may not fare as well. Moving on to the much larger REMAP-CAP study that has been published on a preprint server. REMAP-CAP is an adaptive open-label platform trial that looks at just people with pneumonia who are being admitted uh, to the ICU. And the criteria for inclusion in this part of the trial was ICU admission within 24 hours requiring respiratory or cardiovascular support, most requiring respiratory support, and included people with uh, on mechanical ventilation. It was done mostly in the UK. Uh, there was no CRP entry criterion, which is an important point that I'll come back to. Tocilizumab was given and only minority got a second dose. The primary outcome was a combination of the total number of respiratory and cardiovascular organ support free days up to day 27, uh, sorry, day 21. So it was the number of days total uh, where they were receiving neither respiratory nor cardiovascular organ support. Important secondary outcomes included hospital mortality, 90 day survival, um, and the individual components of respiratory or cardiovascular support, free days, uh, and others. Uh, <clears throat> the study baseline characteristics are shown here. Uh, virtually none were uh, on supplemental oxygen only. Uh, uh, about a third were receiving high flow nasal oxygen. 45% uh, or so non-invasive mechanical ventilation, such as CPAP, BiPAP, and then a significant number were on invasive mechanical ventilation. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the Cirilumab arm uh, because the numbers were so small. But again, importantly, 80% received steroids uh, in combination with uh, uh, tocilizumab or controls.
And here's what happened. There were 10 to 11 fewer days of Oregon support uh, required in the individuals uh, who received uh, tocilizumab, which was highly statistically significant. There was also a survival benefit with the use of tocilizumab with an absolute risk reduction of about 8% or considerably more um, than was seen with um, dexamethasone uh, alone. And uh, here are the uh, labels for the individual curves. Secondary outcomes of in-hospital survival, 90-day uh, survival, respiratory support-free and cardiovascular support-free days, time to ICU discharge, time to hospital discharge, progression to the need of ECMO, me mechanical ventilation, or death uh, were all improved with the use of tocilizumab. And importantly, the estimates of the treatment effect with tocilizumab or sorolimab when combined with steroids were significantly greater than any of the interventions on their own. Importantly, uh, there was no relationship between the CRP level and the outcomes. There was not a CRP inclusion criteria for this study, and a quarter of the uh, participants had a CRP of less than 80. Uh, so even if you had uh, a lowish CRP, there was some evidence of benefit in remap cap. Which takes us to the recovery trial, a very large, ongoing, adaptive platform trial in the UK, uh, where multiple agents are being evaluated at different stages, uh, which gives you the opportunity to drop an arm drop an arm early if it looks like there's no effect for futility uh, or stop enrollment into an arm when there's a sufficient statistical power to uh, uh, determine uh, effect on the primary endpoint. Uh, previously reported mortality benefit that showed earlier with dexamethasone, the primary or the first randomization was to either no additional treatment or dexamethasone, chalitra, hydrochloroquine, uh, this is the mycin, colchicine, convalescent plasma, uh, monoclonal antibody, or aspirin. And then there was a second randomization in individuals who had progressive COVID-19 and an oxygen saturation that was low. And in this study, they had a CRP entry requirement of at least 75. Importantly, 17% assigned to TOSI never received it. This just shows you what the platform trial is. You compare standard of care to these different interventions. You can introduce another arm uh, as the study is ongoing. If something looks like it's not going to be effective, an arm can be dropped and uh, other new arms can be introduced as time goes on. This shows the entry uh, characteristics uh, in uh, the recovery trial. Uh, small numbers on invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, but most were either on uh, high flow nasal oxygen or supplemental, uh, just supplemental oxygen. And here are the primary results. Uh, there was a significant reduction in mortality, again, with tocilizumab. Importantly, on this forest plot, uh, showing uh, the risk of mortality on the left and hospital discharge on the right. There was a uh, clear interaction between corticosteroid use and uh, use of tocilizumab, where the uh, people who received the combination of both uh, had uh, clear evidence of benefit, where those who uh, did not receive the combination that received the tocilizumab alone uh, there is no documented benefit, although the numbers are smaller. So this is a suggestion of a larger proportional mortality reduction among, among those receiving a corticosteroid compared to those uh, who did not. In the meta-analysis that was performed by the recovery folks, uh, there was a clear mortality benefit from the use of uh, tocilizumab, 
The authors concluded in COVID-19 patients who are hypoxic and have evidence of systemic inflammation, treatment or the combination of a systemic corticosteroid plus tocilizumab would be expected to reduce mortality by about one third for patients receiving simple oxygen and nearly one half for those receiving invasive mechanical ventilation. I've tried to summarize on this slide uh, a variety of uh, randomized controlled trials of tocilizumab with the larger, uh, more recent studies towards the right of the table. Importantly, uh, the number of super infections uh, tend to be about the same in both, uh, sometimes uh, lower uh, with tocilizumab, but no evidence of increased infection. And in recovery, remap cap and impecta, the studies that included uh, a high proportion also receiving uh, glucocorticoids, uh, there was uh, clear benefits in uh, multiple endpoints with the remap cap and recovery also having uh, an overall mortality benefit. I'd like to share some thoughts about treatment of COVID at this point. In a pandemic, we need to learn to make decisions based on incomplete information. Clinical trials are useful for preliminary evidence of safety and efficacy, but we must then use preclinical information, our prior experience, and scientific intuition to fill the gap rather than doing endless trials to test every possible permutation and combination, and freezing ourselves in a state of inertia while the trials are still ongoing and answers are pending and people are dying. This is from Dr. Chowdhury. When lives are at stake, you sometimes have to supersede the holy grail of randomized controls trials and use judgment, good judgment in the context of compassion for our fellow man, even when there is the slimmest reason, reason to believe something might work. I'd like to add somewhat more prag pragmatically that preliminary series published as early as March 2020 suggested benefit from tocilizumab. We now have data from randomized controlled trials with TOSI involving greater than 6,400 participants. There's essentially no safety signal of concern. There are now clear data from large trials documenting benefit in primary and many secondary endpoints in severe and critically ill patients. We need to use it. The question is not if, but how to best use IL-6 antagonism in severe to critical illness. And I would add, we have a long ways to go at uh, getting the mortality rate even lower. The notably conservative NIH guideline panel has recently come out based on remapping recovery trial results in their most recent <clears throat> update of the NIH guidelines to recommend tocilizumab in combination with dexamethasone in hospitalized patients who are exhibiting rapid respiratory decompensation due to COVID-19. And consistent with the remap cat trial in the first bullet, recent hospitalized patients admitted to the ICU within 24 hours or recent require invasive mechanical ventilation or non-invasive ventilation or high flow nasal cannula uh, or recently hospitalized patients not in the ICU with rapidly increasing oxygen needs who require uh, non-invasive ventilation or high flow nasal cannula and have significant increased markers of inflammation. Uh, the recovery trial uh, results And then finally, in hospitalized patients who require conventional oxygen, uh, they recommend remdesivir uh, alone, uh, remdesivir plus dexamethasone or dexamethasone uh, alone. And they did feel there was insufficient evidence for benefit from the addition of tocilizumab, but some panel members would also give tocilizumab to patients with rapidly increasing oxygen needs while on dexamethasone, but who do not yet require non-invasive ventilation or high flow nasal cannula. I would agree with that statement. In the final minutes, I'll talk about baricitinib. Act 2 was a study of remdesivir with or without baricitinib for hospitalized uh, COVID-19. A minority were on invasive mechanical ventilation. Most were just on supplemental oxygen, and there was a significant proportion that were on high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive uh, mechanical ventilation. Baricitinib 
is an oral uh, JAK-1-2 inhibitor, which is approved for uh, rheumatoid arthritis and uh, in inhibits inflammatory cytokine signaling after a single dose and may have a direct antiviral effect on SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the dose is twice that used in rheumatoid arthritis, or four milligrams um, a day for up to 14 days. Uh, the participants also receive remdesivir uh, for uh, 10 days or till the time of discharge. Uh, most were involved in the United States. The steroids, however, were not allowed unless there was another indication, which limits the usefulness uh, of the results of this trial. The primary endpoint was the time to recovery, uh, defined as ready for hospital discharge. And here are the results. Uh, there was a significant shortening in time to recovery, uh, overall just one day, however. Uh, but those who were on high-flow nasal cannula or other non-invasive mechanical ventilation, there was an eight-day benefit, um, shorter time to recovery with baricitinib compared to placebo. The non-significant differences for no oxygen, low-flow oxygen, invasive mechanical ventilation. Uh, there was a trend for lower 28-day mortality with uh, baricitinib, but this was not statistically significant. There was less new use of oxygen, less progression to death or ventilation, uh, composite uh, endpoint with uh, uh, baricitinib. Uh, and the baricitinib group also had 11 fewer days of receiving new mechanical uh, ventilation, indi indicating uh, some additional benefit. Uh, there were fewer adverse events and actually fewer infections uh, with baricitinib. So like tocilizumab, uh, there's no uh, uh, data suggest these are increasing infections. So where did this lead? Leave us now. Well, convalescent plasma really not indicated for in inpatient treatment at this time. There's no role for monoclonal antibodies either in hospitalized patients at this point. Dexamethasone certainly works with this caveat for moderate disease. It shouldn't be used. In significant mortality invention, uh, advantage with dexamethasone, it's not clear what role of baricitinib will be except where dexamethasone is contraindicated. Remdesivir helps, particularly in severe non-critical disease. The role from remdesivir in more critical illness is less clear. <clears throat> With both tocilizumab and baricitinib, adverse events are not increased and often less. Large studies of tocilizumab when combined with steroids have clear and consistent evidence of benefit for the populations that were studied. There's still questions about the sweet spot for tosi and uh, dialing in on who's really most likely to benefit uh, from it. Future studies will address IL-1 and TNF-alpha antagonism and comparing baricitinib use to steroid use. In the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about non-severe disease. This includes mild and moderate illness. And uh, typically, we see these patients in the outpatient setting. So under non-severe disease, I'll share with you our CAC medicine treatment guidelines and we'll discuss different therapeutic agents. So monoclonal antibodies have been studied extensively in this group of individuals. Um, and with that, it's also received an EUA for both monotherapy and combination therapy. Monoclonal antibodies also seem very promising in post-exposure prophylaxis in asymptomatic individuals. I'll also touch on some of the other drugs where we have emerging data that are in bold on the slide. So this is a snapshot from our Keck Medicine Guidelines. In the green panel, what you see is what we routinely offer for clinical care. So the first combination, that's casirivimab and imdivimab. This is uh, by Regeneron. Then BAM as monotherapy by Eli Lilly. And the last combination, BAM and etisivimab, that is again offered by Eli Lilly. At this time, because of the emerging variants, uh, we prefer combination therapy over monotherapy. In the red panel on the right-hand side are drugs where the evidence is not convincing at this time and therefore are, only, are not offered as a part of routine clinical care. With that, let's talk a little bit about monoclonal antibodies. So this was one of the first studies, Blaze 1, 
where we where we looked at the efficacy of monoclonal antibodies on viral load and hospitalization in patients with mild to moderate illness. The reduction in viral load was not very different, but there was a reduction in hospitalization. So let's look at it in detail. This was a randomized control trial. Patients were enrolled within five days of onset of symptoms and they were followed for 29 days. As you can see in the table below in the top row, the mean change in viral load was not different in the BAM arm compared to the placebo arm. However, there was a reduction in hospitalization in the group that received BAM. So you can see 1.6% of the patients in the BAM arm were hospitalized compared to 6.3% in the placebo arm. In a post hoc analysis, the difference was more pronounced, 4.2% in the treatment arm versus 14.6% in the placebo arm. So the data was encouraging, though the numbers were few. Let's look at the efficacy of combination therapy. This is the Regeneron combination. And if you look at the right-hand side, here we noticed there was, a there was a reduction in viral load through day seven in the combined arm compared to the placebo arm. And this was, and this was very impressive in the group that had high viral load. In addition, we noticed a reduction in medical visits by 57% between the two arms. There's more data around combination therapy, and this is from the Lilly combination. This is just a press release at this time. And uh, with this, what we've learned is that there was an 87% reduction in hospitalization uh, between the two arms, the treatment and the placebo arm. And here they've shown us two graphs because combination therapy is being offered at uh, different doses. In addition, there were no deaths noted in the treatment arm and 14 deaths noted in the placebo arm where 13 were attributed to COVID-19. So again, very encouraging data. The total number of patients are around 550 in this study. More to come on this. So let's compare the efficacy of monotherapy with combination therapy on viral load and hospitalization. The efficacy is superior with combination therapy as you can see in this graph, the red line represents placebo, light blue, li light blue line represents combination therapy, and the other lines represent monotherapy at different doses. Also, the hospitalizations were lower in the combination arm compared to the placebo arm, though it did not reach statistical significance. So the data thus far looks very encouraging in non-hospitalized folks especially as it relates to reducing hospitalization, that is reducing the severity of illness. Let's look at the data and the impact of monoclonal antibody in hospitalized patients. It's not very encouraging, as shown by the Kaplan-Meier estimates here. The Kaplan-Meier estimate on the left-hand side represents time to sustain recovery, not very different in the placebo uh, and, the mono and the treatment arm. Again, time to hospital discharge was not very different. This is a randomized study. And in this study, 30% of the subjects did not require respiratory support. Others did require respiratory support. MAB was received, was offered within five to nine days of, from symptom onset. This is different from what was done in the outpatient setting with MAB. In the prior studies that we discussed, patients received MABs within five days of symptom onset. So that may also have a role. In this study, 40% of the subjects were already receiving remdesivir and 50% were receiving steroids. So this wasn't very encouraging in hospitalized patients. This time, MAB is recommended in high-risk non-hospitalized patients. If they meet any of the following criteria, they're considered high-risk. If the patient meets this criteria and has been diagnosed within 10 days, symptom, it's been 10 days since symptom onset, that person qualifies for therapy. We have a process at Keck Medicine where if you think your patient meets the criteria, please send an email to asp at med.usc.edu and we'll process it as soon as possible. Our um, experience at Keck Medicine has been good with monoclonal antibodies. And uh, we have offered monoclonal antibody to uh, over 100 patients. The average days from symptom onset to infusion in our patients has been typically 5.7. 50% of the patients received it within five days. In 9% of the patients, we've seen some adverse reaction, and typically this is nausea, vomiting, headache, 
Uh, we've also noted, noted uh, post-infusion hy infusion hypertension in some cases. Percentage of patients who required care, uh, that is for COVID, either in the form of hospitalization or urgent care or ER visit, is 6%. So with this, <clears throat> these are simply IDSA recommendations where IDSA supports uh, giving combination therapy in the outpatient setting, but not so much in the hospitalized setting. Of note, patients who are admitted for another reason, and COVID-19 is an incidental diagnosis, they also may benefit from uh, a monoclonal antibody. However, at this time, HHS does not allow us to use it in that subgroup. So hopefully things will change down the road. With that, let's look at the impact of variants variants on the efficacy of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, I think everybody here is familiar with these variants, but I'll just touch on them really quick. 117, this was identified in the UK and is associated with higher transmissibility and more severe disease. 1351 was first identified in South Africa, and this to some extent can evade our immunity that is generated by natural infection and by vaccines. So what you're looking at in this table are results from neutralization studies where we are looking at IC50, that's the inhibitory concentration. So higher the IC50, lower the efficacy. And what we see here is that IC50 for monotherapy is consistently higher compared to combination therapy across the board. And if you look at B1351, that's the last row, IC50 is very high. And what that means is that likely this is not that effective. However, when it's given in combination, the Regeneron combination, B1531 has a low IC50, which makes it perhaps more efficacious. This is simply in vitro data, and we do not know how it translates to clinical, uh, to clinical efficacy at this time. Of note, I should mention here, the Cal20C variant, uh, which has the L452R mutation, that renders BAM, based on in vitro study, essentially ineffective. And with that, uh, HHS has not allocated, um, allocated BAM to the states where Cal20C variant has been, has been uh, identified. In California, about 20% of the clinical isolates have Cal20C, so we are not receiving BAM. Also, Nevada and Arizona are not receiving a BAM for the same reasons. Uh, interestingly, Cal20C, if you look at antibody neutralization assays, they showed a 4 to 6.7 fold uh, a decrease in neutralization titers with convalescent plasma and a two fold decrease when looked at in uh, vaccine recipients. So hopefully we learn more about this Cal20C variant down the road. With that, what are the final takeaways for monoclonal antibody? It definitely reduces severity of illness, especially when it's given early in the disease within five days. It also reduces viral load, though the significance is unclear, whether it really has a clinical significance. Combination therapy is preferred over monotherapy, especially with the variants. And I think if there is extensive genomic surveillance, monoclonal antibodies can prove very useful in the outpatient setting in reducing morbidity. With that, let's see what's in store <clears throat> for us in the coming months. So there is an ongoing trial in the outpatient setting, the ACTIVE-2 trial. That's an acronym for Acceleration COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions and Vaccines. Um, and you can see several agents are being looked at. Uh, Keck is a site for this study. In addition, from COMET trial, that's COVID-19 monoclonal antibody efficacy trial, there's been favorable outcome based on the interim analysis. Based on the interim analysis, what we have learned is that there was an 85% reduction in hospitalization, which is very encouraging. And also this monoclonal antibody has efficacy against the B351 strain as well. Uh, this is simply a press release, so more to come on this. MAB appeared to be very, very promising in post-exposure profile access setting, especially in, a in, in asymptomatic disease. So there is an ongoing randomized control trial in, in long-term care facilities where thus far it has shown an 80% 80, 80 reduction in symptomatic infection. 
Um, also, Regeneron, the combination monoclonal antibody, has shown 100% prevention of symptomatic infection in people with household exposure to COVID. So very encouraging data. Also, there is going to be another study that's going to be launched in the next few weeks as a part of the COMET trial. Data for hospitalized patients is also being looked at, this trial ACTIVE-3, but it doesn't seem very encouraging. Um, already some of the sub-studies have been closed because of futility. So let's touch on some other therapeutics that have been studied for mild to moderate disease. None of these agents um, uh, have good evidence at this time for us to make it a part of routine clinical care. With SSRIs, we have seen some benefit in clinical deterioration, but the numbers are very small, so difficult to draw conclusions. Ivermectin, based on the recent randomized control trial in Columbia, it does not uh, prove to be useful in symptom resolution. Lastly, evidence on colchicine also does not support routine use. Vitamins have also been looked at, and this was a huge randomized clinical trial where they looked at ascorbic acid and zinc. And uh, as you can see, the reduction of symptoms in the last row here was not different in the standard of care or with ascorbic acid, zinc, or when they were used in combination. So this again is not recommended. Dextromethorphan, interestingly, there's in vitro data that it can, uh, it has pro-viral effect. It's in vitro data, so I think at this time, all we can say is that we should practice caution uh, when we prescribe dextromethorphan to this subgroup of patients. So putting it all together, based on what we know today, monoclonal therapy, in combination is recommended in high-risk patients because that has shown to prevent a progression to severe disease. And data around other agents is emerging at this time or based on the studies we have today, it, it is not promising. So in conclusion, we wanted to share the schematic that nicely outlines the stages in COVID illness and highlights utility of different therapeutics in different stages. So there are three periods. There's a pre-exposure period, viral replication period, and inflammatory period. In the first period, the pre-exposure period, vaccines and our non-pharmaceutical interventions are useful. In the viral replication period, it's antiviral, antivirals like monoclonal antibody, which should be given earlier on within four to five days of symptom onset, and antivirals like remdesivir. While immunomodulators like steroids and interleukin-6 have a, have a big role to play in the later stages of disease. That's in the inflammatory period. This concludes our presentation, and uh, we'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you.